Hi, good evening, everyone. We just have a couple more people just coming in. Um, welcome, everyone, to the first of the fall series um, at Sunnybrook here uh, tonight. Uh, our program is going to be called Older, Wiser, and Important Health Tips as You Age. I'm Helen Hayward, and I'm a volunteer who serves on the board of directors of Sunnybrook Health Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture series. This is our first speaker series of the fall, and we're so glad to be back. We hope you're able to join us for the next two talks of 2019, which will focus on obsessive compulsive disorder, COD, in October, and then on diabetes in November. More details on these talks are available on the Sunnybrook website, or you can sign up to join our mailing list for future events. Tonight, we will be looking at some of the health issues that you have been asking us about. Namely, what do we need to keep in mind as we get older. Some of these issues may not be on your radar, but they should be. As you will hear, vaccines are not only important for young children. I've just had my shingles vaccine about a week or so ago, uh, and then I think soon to be followed by the flu shot uh, in the next week or two. When it comes to vitamins and supplements, not everything is a magic bullet, and you're gonna hear a little bit more tonight. Interestingly, the topic of naloxone, naloxone, God, kids, um, has been increasingly present in the news. Naloxone can temporarily rever reverse an opioid overdose, but you will hear about why your medicine cabinet may need one. As always, we have a great lineup of experts. By the time the lectures are finished tonight, you will, we will all definitely be a little bit wiser, maybe a little bit older, and hopefully a little bit smarter as well. I refuse to keep calling myself older. I don't know, they have to change the word. If you'd like to renew any of the information uh, presented tonight, you can always access the webcast for tonight's talk online. That should be posted within one week. I'd like to now introduce tonight's moderator, Karen Lam. Karen is the manager of Sunnybrook's Ambulatory Patient Pharmacy in the M Wing. If you've ever been there, you know it's a very busy hub and one that so many people rely on. Karen works behind the scenes to ensure that you have your medication before leaving the hospital, especially when getting discharged or going home after a visit to one of the outpatient clinics. Karen and her team at the pharmacy provide services such as medication reviews, smoking cessation counseling, and adherence packaging, to name a few, all to ensure that you get the care that you need. We're very lucky to have Karen here to both present and moderate this evening's discussion. Please help me in giving Karen a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Helen. Can everyone hear me okay? No? Is this better? <laughs> we have a height discrepancy. Is that better? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. And good evening to everyone. Joining us here at the Bayview campus and also watching this event remotely online at home. Tonight, our lecture is called Older, Wiser, Important Health Tips As You Age. My knee today hurts, so I feel like it's a little older today, but we, I want to make sure that we get a chance to cover some of the topics that are very important and very near and dear to us as healthcare practitioners, but also you as patients. We have a very great lineup of topics and experts for you this evening. Andrea Payne will discuss vaccines and boosters that are needed in adulthood. Daphna Steinberg, will address some key points around what you need to know about vitamins and supplements. And then I'll be presenting on something you may not have considered to include in your first, first aid kit at home, a naloxone kit. We'll set aside some time at the end of the evening for you to 
ask our panel of speakers some questions. For the Q&A session, we have placed a small blank white card on each seat. I see some of you are holding the little cue card. Please write your questions on the card and between each speaker, our volunteers will be collecting them from you and just, just raise your hand and they'll come by and collect it and then bring it up for, uh, to be answered. Feel free to get up as you need during the evening as we won't have a formal break. There is washrooms outside the auditorium and there are refreshments located in the foyer, which I saw some of you dabble in already. Any questions or concerns? <laughs> if not, we're gonna actually start off our evening of lectures by introducing our very, very first um, speaker, Andrea Payne. Andrea is a nurse practitioner at the Sunnybrook Family Health Team with 10 years of prior experience as a nurse with the team. She has a passion for immunizations and vaccine preventable diseases. And she is instrumental in running the annual flu clinics in the family practice unit. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome as she presents on community immunity, vaccines needed in adulthood. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you, Karen. Okay, I'm gonna try and set this up and we can be on our way. Thank you for the introduction, Karen. Um, so let me get my slides up here so we have a visual. So my talk today is called Community Immunity, Vaccines Needed in Adulthood. And I'm Andrea, and I am a nurse practitioner in the Family Health Team and I recognize some familiar faces in the audience, so some of you may know me. So I have nothing, no conflicts, nothing to disclose, none of the vaccines that, are, that I'm talking about, I'm not affiliated with any of the pharmaceutical companies that make them, just so you know. So I've titled um, the presentation Community Immunity for a reason, and um, just for, for all of you to know what, what I mean by community immunity. So, um, when most people in a community are uh, immune to a communicable disease um, or a contagious disease, um, it's less likely to be spread. So people who are more susceptible, that would be young infants or, or older adults or people with, who are immunocompromised, then are protected by others being, um, being immune. So even if they can't have the vaccine um, or are not immune themselves, they will be protected by the majority of the community being immune. And that becomes relevant when we talk a little bit uh, later about some of the vaccines. So the vaccines that I've decided to talk about today, uh, you may have heard of in the news um, and maybe visiting your provider, pertussis or whooping cough, uh, pneumonia and shingles. So Helen, right on with your shingrix. So, just before we get going on talking about specific vaccines, I did want to talk about immunity specifically and immunity as, I don't know if that's me, um, immunity as we age. I thought I'd teach you a new word today, um, immunosenescence. So immunosenescence means the natural decreasing immunity with age. Um, this becomes really important when we think about not only, I don't know if this is me, move my hair, there's a lot of it. Ah, okay. So because our immune systems decrease with age, not only is it harder for us to protect our bodies from infections at hand, um, but also it reduces our ability to mount immunity and for immune systems to mount uh, antibodies and immune memory when we receive vaccines. So that becomes really important when we're deciding um, how vaccines are even produced in the beginning and how effective they are going to be in older individuals. And when we think about to last year's flu season, um, if you remember the high dose flu vaccine, that is where that comes in. Um, higher dose would then compensate for the decreased immunity with age. So the high dose is then offered to those who are over 65. 
So we'll talk about the pertussis vaccine. Uh, so uh, pertussis is a bacteria that causes, that's also known as whooping cough. It's, it's spread person to person, usually through coughing, sneezing, um, and it's, it's highly contagious. So um, it is known for uncontrollable and very intense coughing, um, causing, you know, making it very hard to breathe and then causing that whoop um, for gasping. Okay, so uh, most commonly, I know some of you are thinking, why is this up here? I got this when I was a child, or usually children get it, and it's true. It actually affects infants significantly more than older adults, but it can affect adults. And the reason I wanted to talk about it today, it, it is fatal. It can be fatal to children who, and young infants who do get pertussis. Um, and, and complications are pneumonia and seizures and, and brain damage. So there are some really significant complications. And many um, adults here who have grandchildren at home may have newborn grandchildren. So if that child is exposed, they can be at risk. So even though you are immune, if you are transmitting that without getting ill yourself, you can, you, it can be harmful for the child. So that's why I did feel that it was really important to talk about um, with this group as well. So um, pertussis vaccination is available in combination with tetanus um, in various forms. Infants, not infants, children start at two months of age getting five doses of pertussis vaccine, but they only start at two months. So there's that window between birth and two months that the children are then susceptible. Okay, so there's two ways that we can mitigate that risk. One would be to... Um, actually vaccinate um, adults that are in contact with that infant. So whether it's the mother, grandparents, aunts and uncles, adults who are then going to be in, in contact. Um, and that is the recommendation from the National Advisory Committee for Canada, as well as um, the Ministry of Health in Ontario, that adults should receive one dose of tetanus that has the pertussis in it. So if you're due for your next tetanus, Make sure you check on that. Have you had a pertussis dose um, with your last one, okay? But the other way to protect those children is actually immunizing the mother, the pregnant mother before the child is born. So there are national guidelines um, and provincial guidelines that recommend um, boosting pregnant women in utero between 27, it says 32, but it is up to 36 weeks, um, getting that vaccine in pregnancy. That is the time that the antibodies are the highest, so they're actually going to transmit better to the baby and the baby will get the best immunity. Um, and then they are protected, in the, especially in those first two months of life. Um, and pertussis immunization in pregnancy actually um, is estimated to protect about 90% of infants less than three months, so it really is effective. There's a little bit of a discrepancy with the national guidelines and the provincial guidelines on this and what is actually funded because remember, Ontario is the one that just makes the decision about the publicly funded, um, some of the publicly funded vaccines. So um, the, Ontario will only cover one dose in adulthood and that includes pregnant women. So women who have multiple pregnancies who then need, the recommendation is to actually have one in each pregnancy um, from the national guidelines, but the Ontario guidelines will only fund one. So there's still a little bit of a discrepancy. Some women are now paying for those extra ones to protect their newborn, um, even if it's a year or two after the first one. So there are some, some discrepancies, and I will talk about a couple of more discrepancies between national guidelines and Ontario, um, what Ontario is funding. So... This is just actually a picture from the CDC from the US, but they still follow very similar um, recommendations. Children receive five doses up, up until the age of five. Preteens get one 10 years later. For some reason, they say 11 to 12. That's not 10 years after five years old, so it should be 14 to 15 um, right here. And um, pregnant women, and then of course, adults. Um, if you just at least having one in your adult life. All right. So we're going to talk about pneumonia. Um, also, lots to talk about this time of year. More, more of this scene for sure. Um, so pneumococcal pneumonia is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. 
Um, immunocompromised individuals, people with multiple comorbidities, chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory illnesses like asthma and COPD are significantly more, um, a significantly higher risk of contracting pneumonia. Um, many of you already know what pneumonia is. I'm not going to get into deep, too much detail, but it's usually upper respiratory symptoms, um, product, significantly productive cough, fever, shortness of breath, fatigue, um, all of these things. Um, and complications can happen when the bacteria that causes the pneumonia actually transfers to sites that are normally sterile environments. They normally have no living um, other bacteria or viruses living in, the, in that area. And that would be things like blood and the brain. Highest risk of complications, not surprisingly, and we've seen this with other things, under eight, two and over 65. So this, we're not going to stay long in this. I just wanted to show you where those age ranges come from. This is a Canadian study that was, was done in 2016, looking at pneumonia across the country. So it's, this is a national study looking at the burden of pneumonia um, in the first column of all types of pneumonia, not just pneumococcal. Um, you can see this is actually hospitalization. This is not you being diagnosed with pneumonia in your primary care provider's office. This is actually hospitalization. So the highest risk is under four and over six, over 60. You can see the huge jump here. Um, and this equally, this is pneumococcal pneumonia specifically, high risk under four and really spikes up um, after about 50, 55, 60. This down here is mortality or the deaths from pneumonia. So this is all cause. And this is specifically a pneumococcal, but you can see the increasing trend over 60 highest risk, okay? And this is Canadian. So uh, what kind of pneumococcal, what, what pneumonia vaccines are available? So there are two types, um, Pneumovax 23, which covers two, 23 strains of pneumonia. Um, and it is, it is um, a, the, the antigen in the pneumovax is actually bound to a sugar, and it's different from Prevnar, which only has 13 strains, but it's bound to, bound to a protein. And the reason why the sugar and protein pieces is, is important is that that's, your body takes those up slightly differently. So they have different, slightly different uptake in the body and different immune response. The recommendations in national guidelines and in Ontario um, is one dose of pneumovax that one with the 23 strains should be given to all adults over 65. So if you are in this room over 65 and you haven't had it, you better talk to your primary care provider next time you're in, okay? Over 65, everyone should have the pneumonia vaccine. And this is regardless of risk factors. Everybody over 65 should have a pneumonia vaccine. They are given earlier for people who have really higher risk conditions. And I'll get into that high risk because that can be a little bit, uh, that can put us in different categories. So the National Advisory Committee and the Ministry of Health, so the Ontario um, guidelines, um, recommend high risk people actually receive both of these vaccines. The Prevnar 13, this one first, and then the Pneumovax 23. It actually improves the antibody response and the, the immune system memory for the pneumonia vaccine. So it's actually more effective. Prevnar 13, this one here on its own, is not enough for people over 60 to get enough immunity. Pneumovax is a lot better on its own, but the two together have the best, um, provide the best immunity. Um, Prevnar 13, this one here, actually originally in 2002, Prevnar itself started out as pediatric vaccine. So it's for babies. Um, and it, it was so, it was about 2002, it was so effective at decreasing the rates of pneumococcal infection in children for ear, pneumococcal strains that were causing ear infections and pneumonia that it was then tested to be used in adults um, because it was so effective. And kids now receive three doses um, when they're infants. Um, what's, when we say high risk here, so high risk people should have both, the problem comes again with the discrepancy between what the national recommendations are, Public Health Agency of Canada and the National Advisory Committee recommend 
and what is actually funded publicly in Ontario. So high risk in Ontario to receive both of these vaccines or for this Prevnar vaccine specifically would be people who have had a transplant, who don't have a spleen, who are significantly immunocompromised, either HIV or for other, other conditions. Um, those people would be funded to get this Prevnar 13 in addition. However, the National Advisory Committee also considers things like diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, um, and uh, chronic respiratory diseases like asthma and COPD, they count those as, as high risk. So they, in their recommendations, say that people in those groups as well should be getting both of these. So there are discrepancies because then those people aren't covered, that it's not funded for those groups. Um, however, if you are meeting with your primary care provider and you do have one of those chronic diseases that I, I did mention, diabetes, heart disease, Kidney, kidney disease, liver disease, things like that, I would really encourage you to consider that and have a discussion with your provider about having both of these vaccines because you are more, more high risk. Many um, private insurance companies are covering these is what I'm seeing. However, that vaccine, the Prevnar on its own, um, costs about $120, okay? People who have never received a pneumonia vaccine and decide to, to, uh, to get this Prevnar vaccine should have it first before the Pneumovax 23, okay? Goes in order of the, of the number, so 13, then 23, okay? They're about two months apart, but those are just details that can be discussed when you meet with your primary care provider, okay? Um, I think that's, we can move on. So I hear all giggling there, but for any of you in the audience who have had shingles, it is no joke, right? I'm seeing some nods. Um, for those of you who don't know, shingles or herpes zoster is a reactivation of previous varicella infection, so previous chicken pox. You'll love my little chicken here. Um, previous chicken pox. So either childhood or adult, most, most people do get that in childhood and they're now vaccinating against that. So that will change the way we look at the shingles vaccines with the cohort moving forward into, um, who have had uh, the varicella vaccine. But it causes severe um, nerve pain, itching, and a blistering rash over the nerve that is affected. Um, it is, it's actually low risk of transmission. So people think it's quite contagious. It's actually not that contagious. The most contagious time would be if somebody actually was with bare hand or bare skin touching the blisters on that rash when they are open uh, blisters. That is the highest risk of transmission. But it's actually about a third of that of, uh, of chicken pox itself. So chicken pox in childhood, very contagious. I think you remember, you know, you went to your friend's house when they had chicken pox and then suddenly you and your brother and sister all had chicken pox and it was a chicken pox party, right? That it is, is chicken pox is very contagious. This, not so much. It's the contact with the blisters that really make it uh, contagious. Once the lesions have actually crusted over, it's no longer um, contagious at all with touching. So um, most frequently this occurs in older adults and immunocompromised, not surprisingly, some th a theme that we're seeing um, throughout when I'm talking about risk factors or high risk groups. And one in three Canadians can develop shingles in their lifetime. And the incidence, the severity and the severity of the complications uh, definitely increases over the age of 50. Um, one of the biggest complications, um, and I wish this on nobody, post-herpetic neuralgia, which is actually um, post-infection, so after the shingles, continuous and chronic nerve pain in that area. So chronic being over three months. So anything lasting than three longer than three months after the initial shingles is then chronic pain related. Some people have it permanently. So, and it can be absolutely debilitating, depending on different areas of the body, but generally it, it can be, it can affect people's quality of life. Um, and another one would be actually the location of where the shingles happens. Zoster ophthalmicus, it's a fancy, fancy word, but means the shingles in the eye, and it can cause blindness. 
So we really need to protect people from shingles, um, from prevent all those complications. Um, and it can reduce the shingles vaccines can reduce the incidence of shingles and its complications. Currently in Canada, there are two different types of vaccines available. Zostavax, which has been around, it was about 2010-ish. Um, and then the newer one, Shingrix. So um, I think many of you have heard about these. There's been lots of talk about Shingrix in the news. Um, and there are, again, here we go back to discrepancies. This is a big discrepancy right now uh, between the National Advisory Committee, Public Health Association of Canada, and the, um, the publicly funded in Ontario, what's available publicly funded um, in Ontario. So um, we'll get talking about that. I'm just gonna show you a little comparison. There's a lot of words on here. It's just used to help um, guide the differences between the two. But the first one um, on the left here, Zostavax. This was the first one that came out and the first one that was available, 2010-11-ish. It's a live vaccine. Okay, so it can't be given to people who are immunocompromised because it can actually cause um, um, shingles in those people, and it can't be given to pregnant women. So there's con some contraindications here to, to, to certain people can't have it. It's only one dose, but if we look at the efficacy here, overall it's about 51%. Not, not that great. And we know that the protection really wanes after about a year. Definitely after three years and after five years, it's a bit uncertain. And in my practice, I have seen people who had had the shingle, the Zostavax and have come back with um, shingles three, or, three to five years later, around that. So I'm not surprised to see when I pulled up these numbers that I wasn't surprised to see that. Um, this one is free for people 65 to 70, currently in Ontario. Otherwise, it's about $220 a dose. But this is the one that is publicly funded currently. Okay, this is the only one that the ministry covers in Ontario right now. When we look at Shingrix, this is the, I'm calling them old and new, so forgive me, I still kind of do that because it, that is what they are. This is the older one and this is now the new one. This Shingrix is an adjuvanted um, vaccine. It has an adjuvant in it, which technically means it's booster. It's going to boost the uptake of that vaccine. If you remember in the beginning, my first slide, how I spoke about how our immunity decreases as we age. And that also means that our immunity isn't um, going to up take, take up vaccines as well or mount an immunity with these vaccines, build antibodies and immune memory as well either. So having something like an adjuvant in it increases and compensates for that decrease in the immune system, actually boosts up the immune system a lot better in people who have that waning immunity. This one is two doses, and they're given about two to six months apart, can be up to a year. And look at the, look at the um, efficacy. So if we look at overall, out of all age groups from 50 up, 97%. That's the average of these ages. If we pick over 60 as a comparison, 97% from age 60 to 69 is just a comparison. So it is significantly more effective. Big difference. Um, also, the protection is showing in the current studies to last longer. So minimal waning after at least four years and some studies demonstrating up to nine years. So we're already miles ahead. Um, of that Zostavax in terms of length of protection. Here's the, here's the kicker. Remember, it's not covered. So this one costs $150 a dose and requires two doses. So that's $300 for a full vaccination. The National Advisory, I'm going to go back, but National Advisory Committee, that's the Public Health Agency of Canada, doesn't, it doesn't even mention Zostavax now as a recommendation. They recommend this Shingrix, this two-dose new Shingrix, as the recommendation for everybody over the age of 50 should be having this vaccine. But it is not yet covered. 
I am hoping that that will change in the near future. I have lots of people who are getting this vaccine regardless. Many um, of private health insurance companies I'm not going to say many. Some private health insurance co uh, companies are covering this Shingrix, um, and it is the um, national recommendation for, um, for everybody over 50 to have this. The other piece is we talked about this adjuvant. Um, if the adjuvant is really boosting your immune response, there is the possibility that you're going to have a stronger reaction to the vaccine. And by reaction, I do mean localized site reaction. So where the, where the injection was actually, actually given can be a bit more warm, tender, swollen. Um, but also people can get fever and fatigue following this because that immune response is really heightened from that adjuvant. I usually tell people to do it the day before they can just lounge at home. So that's, that helps. Um, that's just the efficacy. So yes, unfortunately, it's not covered yet, but hopefully that will change in the new, near future, along with some of the, the pneum pneumococcal vaccines that I spoke about. So just in summary, reminder, pertussis, so the whooping cough, all adults should have one dose of tetanus that includes that whooping cough protection, more if the um, person is pregnant, um, so they would receive that in each pregnancy. Pneumonia, discuss with your healthcare provider about your risks and what high risk means. And if you have any of those high risk uh, conditions and the appropriateness for you to get Prevnar 13 and or Pneumovax. But reminder, everybody over 65 should absolutely have the Pneumovax 23. And that's publicly funded. That's in the, I've got them in my fridge in the, in the family practice. So um, those are available publicly funded. And for shingles. As I discussed, the most effective shingles vaccine that we have available right now in Canada, um, and it's the same guidelines that are used for the U.S. as well, they have the same recommendations as we do, um, is Shingrix, and that's the two-dose shingles vaccine, um, but it's not currently publicly funded, and you need a prescription from your primary care provider um, to get this vaccine. Um, and the National Advisory Committee recommends that this one is received for everybody over the age of 50. And I know what you're thinking, giving we're heading into this season. Don't forget your flu shot, right? Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to put it up. Thank you very much, Andrea. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please write it on that little white card and hold it up for our volunteers to come and collect. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Daphna Steinberg. Daphna is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator who specializes in the nutrition care of obstetrics patients at Sunnybrook. She has worked in a number of areas, including obstetrics, cardiology, pediatrics, long-term care, HIV, and the intensive care unit setting, just to name a few. She is involved in research, teaching, and she sits on many hospital committees. Please welcome Daphna to the podium to discuss vitamins and supplements, hype or helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so hyper helpful, what do you think? Which one? <laughs> All right, oh, I got the same hair, <laughs> so we'll try and keep it out of the way. All right, so uh, hopefully before I'm finished today, um, you will understand which vitamins and supplements make. Is this my hair doing this? <laughs> okay. No, I'm afraid to move. Um, which supplements may or may not be helpful with aging? Detach me, whatever works. Oh, is it this? Okay. And also how to recognize 
how to recognize how to choose supplements uh, safely. So some background on um, vitamins, minerals, supplements in general. So we know that diet is important for disease prevention and that many older adults do not need recommendations uh, for nutrients from food alone. And um, so many uh, dietary supplements are used by older people in particular, mainly in, with the expectation of reducing um, disease risks for developing cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, cognitive impairment or memory loss, and also skeletal muscle mo loss. And in the US, about half of people ages 57 to 85 uh, years old use some kind of dietary supplement regularly, spending on average about 100 US dollars per person per year. So that's what, about $1,000 Canadian? Thank you. I'm going to try, guys. Um, so Hippocrates once said that everything in excess is opposed to nature. Okay? And so we need to keep in mind that, um, you know, too much of a good thing is probably too much of a good thing. I, I do want to give you a disclaimer. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is general information. It is not specific to you because I don't know you. Okay, um, you may have a reason that you need something that I might tell you is not helpful for other things, or I may tell you it's helpful for something, and there may be a reason why you shouldn't be taking it. Um, so for your own information, you should speak to your healthcare provider. Okay. We're gonna go somewhat alphabetically, although I will go in and out of the alphabet a little bit, and we're not gonna cover every supplement out there. I've sort of chosen a few select ones. So vitamin A um, is important because we need it for growth, development, and immunity, as well as reproduction, which probably most of us are finished with by now, um, as well as vision, which hopefully we're not finished with quite yet. Okay? Beta carotene and or vitamin A palmitate. Um, so beta carotene, what is it? Okay? Beta carotene is an antioxidant, which is what we call stuff um, really most of our um, fat-soluble vitamins, which are vitamins A, D, E, and K. Okay? And it gives, uh, the vitamin A is what gives fruits and vegetables their orangey and red coloring. And what beta carotene does is it's converted to vitamin A in the body. Okay? So when we use beta carotene in supplements, then it, it becomes vitamin A in the body. So that's why we're talking sort of about the uh, beta carotene here. Um, so there was a study that looked at beta carotene and or vitamin A that was given to participants for six years um, to people who were 62 years when they started the six years. And what they actually found was a tendency to increase mortality from all causes. Now, this was not statistically significant, which means that they couldn't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it did increase mortality, um, but just something to keep in mind. Um, anti vitamin A has anti-cancer properties. It also has properties that can enhance tumor growth. Okay? So the yin and the yang. Uh, we do know that beta carotene supplementation, supplementation excuse me, in people who smoke increases the risk for lung and prostate cancers. And there's also an increase, um, a trend toward increased cardiovascular mortality in people who use beta carotene supplements. B vitamins. So there's lots of B vitamins, okay? Um, thiamine, riboflavin, folic acid, okay? All of those are different um, B vitamins and there's more than that. Um, they're available individually. They're also available in B complexes. And what we know is that um, there is a trend toward increasing all-cause all mortality from B vitamins also. Um, even though these, uh, you would pee out if you get too much of it. So interesting here. Uh, B3, which is also known as niacin, has a trend toward de decreasing cardiovascular mortality. Um, but again, not statistically significant, so can't say for sure that it will. Vitamin B6 in high amounts for more than a year um, can actually cause nerve damage that can impact body movement. Thankfully, it is reversible by stopping that vitamin B6. 
a B, a B complex, um, which I see, I've seen over the last few years becoming more and more popular, and I'm not really quite sure why. Um, however, it does have the benefit of potentially decreasing stroke risk, um, as does folic acid. Vitamin C. Somebody was mentioning to me when, uh, when they came in today that they take vitamin C sometimes. Um, so vitamin C is also an antioxidant, but it is a water-soluble antioxidant. So we pee it out. Um, and the beauty of that is that, you know, it's hard to get too much. Most of us probably know about vitamin C deficiencies causing things like scurvy. If you ever paid attention to when people were crossing over the ocean on long trips and then they started to bring oranges along and suddenly scurvy went away, which is great. Um, we know that getting enough vitamin C may protect against esophageal, lung, and head and neck cancers, but it may promote breast cancer in postmenopausal women who also have high vitamin C intake from their diet. We also know that smoking increases the risk of deficiency. And we know, and I, I didn't put this on the slide, I thought I would just mention it, that high doses of vitamin C does increase the risk of kidney stones. And if you've ever had a kidney stone and passed a kidney stone, or if you've known anyone who's ever passed a kidney stone, you do not want a kidney stone. All right. <laughs> okay. So vitamin D is another fat-soluble vitamin. Okay, which means we don't pee it out. Any excess that we have gets stored in our fat. And its main job is to help with calcium stability and bone health. Um, there is a trend, although not statistically significant, for vitamin C supplementation to help with protection from heart attacks. Um, and we also have seen in studies that a dose of 400 IU, or international units, every day decreases the risk of fractures, except for hip fractures. And there's no benefit to a higher dose than that 400 IU. And we've been seeing lately, and I'm, I'm betting Karen can attest to this as well, people are going for much higher doses of vitamin D lately. It seems to be the super vitamin these days. Sorry, try not to move. Um, and it's, it's hard to understand why that might be if you're not deficient in something. It may reduce the risk of falls, which is really, really interesting. How that happens, we're not quite sure. Um, when taken with calcium, that can increase the risk of kidney stones again. We've already talked about not wanting to go there. Um, low vitamin D levels, so if you get tested for vitamin D and to be covered, Okay, just keep, thank you so much. Um, sorry about that. Um, so to be tested for vitamin D, you need, um, and for it to be covered by OHIP, you need to fall into certain categories like have osteoporosis um, or have a malabsorptive condition, like if you've had bariatric surgery or something like that or Crohn's. Um, but most people will not be able to get their vitamin D levels checked okay? um, and low, without paying for it. But low vitamin D levels can help to predict the development of coronary artery disease, but can also cause insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is basically when our cells sort of rust shut a little bit and, and we become more resistant to the insulin that we make, which can raise our blood sugars, leading to diabetes. Um, and vitamin D may also decrease cancer risk, except for prostate cancer risk, which it might increase. So again, the yin and the yang. Vitamin E is another fat-soluble vitamin. It's needed for cell growth and function. Um, it does not prevent dementia or improve cognitive function in those with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. It may slow functional decline in those with Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's not thought to prevent cancer or heart disease. And high doses of vitamin E may cause stroke. I'm just going to try and 
Calcium. So calcium is one of those uh, minerals that have been in the news a lot over the last few years. Does calcium cause heart disease? Does it not cause heart disease? Does it calcify the arteries? So many conversations about this. I think actually another study came out today, but I'd already sent in my slides. Um, anyway, um, it is an, a mineral that's important for bone health as well as hormonal balance, nerve and vascular function. And when it's combined with vitamin D, it can reduce the risk of fracture, but not if you take it alone. And when I say that it's combined, I don't mean you have to take it at the same moment. Okay? Taking calcium and vitamin D during, on the same day will do the trick. You don't have to take them at the exact same moment. Um, it is recommended for those who are being treated for osteoporosis. Side effects include kidney stones and gastrointestinal symptoms like constipation. Um, there is a trend toward increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and all-cause mortality. Um, but despite the constipation, it may decrease your risk of colorectal cancer. Um, and it can increase the risk of age-related macular degeneration. So that's um, uh, sort of weakening of the eyes. Iron is a, another mineral, um, and it's essential for helping with, uh, for helping carry oxygen around the body um, to tissues growth, um, for growth and for neurological development and cell function. Uh, high doses can cause nausea and constipation. My pregnant patients, who are not you, uh, can definitely attest to this. I get those complaints a lot. Um, iron can also interfere with zinc absorption, um, and it can interact with several medications. And on that note, I want to mention that if you are taking any of these supplements and you haven't told your primary care doctor or your nurse practitioner or any other specialist who might be prescribing any medication to you and your pharmacist, you definitely want to mention that because these things, even though they are natural in the world, you know, these things come from food potentially, they can interfere with medications. Um, which is really important. Multivitamins. So tons of formulations out there. You know, health food stores really survive on these things. Um, pharmacies as well carry lots of different options. Um, they are a mixture of vitamins and minerals, and some of them also contain herbs like ginkgo or other ingredients like fatty acids. And we're going to talk about omega-3, which is a fatty acid, in a couple minutes. Uh, what we know about multivitamins is that long-term use does not provide cognitive benefits to males 65 years or older, and there's no benefit to taking a multivitamin for cardiovascular mortality, cancer mortality, or all-cause mortality. So, you know, we used to think of these as an insurance policy, but potentially not. Spend your money on your, on your actual insurance. Oh, this is really, I'm so sorry about this, the uh, static. So omega-3s omega are fatty acids, and they're essential fatty acids. And by essential, I mean your body cannot produce omega-3s. Okay? They're found predominantly in fatty fish, uh, specifically DHA or docosahexaenoic acid. That's why we call it DHA. EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid both found in fish, and ALA, or alpha-linolenic acid, is found in, in vegetarian sources of omega-3 like flaxseed. But it's only found in the middle of the flaxseed. Okay? If you don't grind up your flax, you're not getting at the omega-3 in the middle because that fiber coating on the outside, we don't digest that. Um, and our bodies are not particularly good at converting ALA into EPA and DHA. So fish, definitely a great option to getting your EPA and DHA. But in terms of supplements, um, we know that um, they may benefit cognitive function in those with a deficiency. They decrease the risk of a heart attack. They can help relieve symptoms of dry eye disease. There are some side effects like but they tend to be mild, like bad breath or headaches, heartburn, nausea, and diarrhea. 
Protein powders have been uh, becoming more popular lately also, so I thought I would touch on these for a moment. Um, basically what they are, they're powdered forms uh, of protein that come from either dairy, and those would be your casein or your whey-based protein powders, eggs, or plant-based, and these are the ones that are getting much more popular, so soy, pea, rice, etc. Um, there's limited data on the side effects. We really don't know if these are helpful or not. Um, but to keep in mind, they may include added sugars and calories. And many, particularly the plant-based, include high levels of lead, arsenic, cadmium, and BPA. So not, not my first choice. Um, I always prefer protein from food. CoQ10 um, is something that is naturally present in our body, um, but lots of people take it these days, and we know that it may actually decrease the risk of complications from heart surgery, um, but to the best of our knowledge, there's no benefit to cancer prevention or blood pressure. So shifting away from the individual vitamins and other supplements, I want to just mention how to choose these products safely if you do decide that you want to take one or if somebody else recommends to you that you take one. And by someone, I mean your healthcare provider, okay? Not your friend, not the internet. Um, so what you'll see on the picture here at the bottom, and it's not super easy, it's a bit dark, but on the bottom here, there's this little NPN number, okay? Or natural product number. And what that means is that Health Canada has actually looked at the product and seen that what is inside is what it says on the label. The products that don't have that NPN number have not actually been validated, which means they could have anything inside the bottle. Doesn't mean they do, but they could. Um, so my recommendation, because um, if you order online, you could be getting products from anywhere. Okay. is try and avoid that. I would say first choice, pharmacy, second choice, health food store, but look for that NPN number. Um, and if you're not sure about taking something, or if you think that you might want to start taking something, talk to your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your pharmacist, a dietitian, okay, um, to get more information on the product and what benefits or risks it may have for you. And also to check about those interactions between drugs and supplements. So in summary, um, there's some research to support some supplements for prevention of some conditions. Um, most internet claims out there, not supported. Um, too much of anything, not a good thing. We want to aim for a balanced diet, which is probably what, what you expected to hear from the dietitian. Um, and if you're deficient in something, you may need a supplement, but otherwise, save your money. Maybe spend it on the vaccines. <laughs> Thank you, Daphna. This is a reminder. If you have a question, please hold up your card. After you've written the question, oh, that there's definitely you've made everyone have questions. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, please hold up your cards to get, get our volunteers to collect them. Oh. I think I'm having. Is the mic being fixed? Should I? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I'll be presenting our final topic of the evening: naloxone kits and why you may need one. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, let's see if the no hair with the mic thing works. <laughs> Next up. <laughs> All right. Who, how many of you have actually heard of naloxone kits? Oh, good portion of you. Very good. How many of you um, have family members who have one? It's okay. If you don't want to say that's fine. I just wanted to see if you've heard of them and have seen what's inside. I've actually brought two. 
from the pharmacy. They do not have drugs in them, okay? Um, but um, if you're interested in what's actually inside, I have samples of like a demo kit so that you can come and see afterwards. So naloxone kits. If you've ever had surgery in Canada, most likely post-op you have received a prescription for some kind of pain medication, Tylenol, some kind of anti-inflammatory, and then probably some kind of opioid like hydromorphone or what we call Percocets or Oxycocets. Most of the time pharmacists and pharmacy staff don't offer you a naloxone kit in those situations because it's a very, very short period of time. Some of you I know have come to our pharmacy and said, I don't need that, I'm doing okay. Just put it on hold and I'll leave it be. But for, for those people who have chronic pain and who can't just take Tylenol or acetaminophen, this may be something to think about. Thank you. Why this topic, you may ask? I'm sure you've seen some of these articles. Some of these are actually pretty recent from September of 2019. There's this thing called the opioid crisis, and we hear it in the news a lot. I don't know if any of you follow the, the stats and all the information that's being provided. The latest one says that we actually, in Canada and in the US, prescribe seven times more opioids than in Sweden. And there's so many stats and so many numbers that sometimes it can be very daunting to realize what the essential information is. We do have to go back a little bit to figure out where this came about. You know, we keep, keep hearing about it, but w when did it start? So talking about opioids, like, wh where do they come from? Did they just come out of left field? Anyone recognize the, the plant that's on there? Very good. So the first, any, anyone know the first opioid that was extracted from the poppy? Opium, opium. the first uh, extracted one. Opium is actually in the poppy plant. What's the first opioid? Heroin wasn't the first one. <laughs> morphine, very good. Uh, morphine was the very first one. Morphine is actually six times stronger than opium, hence the extract. And um, it was already being used throughout the world for pain. And from that discovery came a lot more other discoveries as well, including semi-synthetic and synthetic opioids. But where did the crisis come from? So a little bit of history. Opioids actually came about after a, uh, well, the opium plants, but the extraction of the morphine was actually discovered by a, a German, uh, German pharmacist named uh, Friedrich Sturtner. I'm sorry if I pronounced that one incorrectly. And he actually uh, had a toothache. And the history, as the story goes, that he had a toothache, so he extracted morphine, and he tried to figure out what the most optimal dose was to balance the side effects versus the actual pain relief. And then a little bit further down, and as one of the, uh, one of the, the uh, audience members has mentioned, heroin actually was invented in 1874. And a drug company actually invented heroin and advertised it as a cough syrup. And now we know it's very much not a cough syrup. And we jump now to 1991, when we actually have what we call the first wave of the opioid epidemic. And some of you have may have heard of this in the news as well, uh, this is when prescribing opioids and opioid combinations were increasingly acceptable for non-cancer related pain. And that drug companies were saying, saying that it's safe, it's safe to actually use. And so there was increasing, pres increased prescribing of this medication or these medications. And as the identification of the crisis came about, that's when you know prescribing practices changed, things changed with the availability of these medications, and that's when the second uh, wave came about. Second wave came about because of the limitation to access of these medications, hence a lot of folks unfortunately turned to heroin and injectable heroin, which means that uh, because of the injection process and the use of non-sterile needles, there's a lot more diseases that came about as well. And then after tackling that one, new medications came on the market, and hence our third wave of the opioid crisis. There are now more synthetic opioids like fentanyl and uh, there's different drugs that are more homemade and there are a lot of impurities 
hence causing a lot more diseases and potential for people who not, are not expecting to be taking opioids to accidentally take them. And here we are in 2019. So looking at some stats from Canada, so in 2016, out of all the apparent opioid deaths, we have 3,017 people who actually died from opioid overdose. Um, 867 of them were actually in Ontario. In 2018, 4,460. And, and uh, 1,471 of them came from Ontario. What are we gonna do about these numbers? Something a little more recent. In March 2019 alone, EMS or paramedics had to use naloxone for 300, over 300 suspected opioid overdoses. And they're all accidental. So if you look at the stats from 2016, 2017, and 2018, a good portion of them are actually accidental. They're not intentional. So if there's so many, there's, you know, accidents happen. We all know that, you know, we get taught that when we were little, but these accidents have very, very severe consequences. And because of that, doing something, even if it's just pure education and knowing what's available out there is actually better than doing nothing at all. I know that we could talk about the opioid crisis for a very, very long time. And it's a, very, it's a topic that brings many points of views, but that's not the focus of the talk today. What I want you to leave tonight is, with is knowing more about what to do in those emergency situations. And the power of doing that is just, it's, it's good. How do you know? I guess first of all is how do you know if someone is suffering from an opioid overdose? So these are some of the signs and symptoms. So blue lips and nails, dizziness, confusion, can't be woken up, choking, gargling, snoring, uh, slow, irregular, weak or no breathing, drowsiness, small pinpoint pupils. If you look at these signs and symptoms, and if you've taken, ever taken a CPR or first aid course, some of these symptoms sound like maybe someone's choking, it could be uh, you know, low sugars, it could be symptoms of a lot of things. It's important to recognize someone who has these signs and symptoms and what to do in that situation. The first thing I always say is, if you're not in the medical profession to know how to diagnose someone and what they actually have, the best thing is to call 911. How many of you in this room have a cell phone? How many of you know where the closest, closest phone is? Very good. Um, the closest phone is actually the person who, next to you who has a cell phone. So, <laughs> So make sure that's, uh, and this, I know this is a silly question, but when you're under stress and under duress, the first question when someone asks you to call 911 is, what's the number for 911? So please remember 911 is the number if, in Canada and in the States. If you're abroad, the number changes. Most of them is 911, but um, for example, in Hong Kong, it's, it's 999. But uh, wherever you are, know where the, the emergency number is, not just because of this, but just so that you have access to emergency services. But for those who haven't taken CPR and first aid, this is my plug, and this is uh, to, to take it, even if it's just CPR, because it could actually save a life uh, one day, and even if it's just to recognize those signs and symptoms of when someone actually needs help. If you're not sure, if you can't wake the person up, I always say call 911 just in case, okay? So how naloxone makes a difference? Now that you know and recognize some of the signs and symptoms, it, this is education on how naloxone can help in that situation. This is pharmacology class a little bit, but um, naloxone is actually what we call an opioid antagonist. So it actually likes the same receptor as the opioids, but um, it does the opposite thing that opioids do. It also likes the receptor more, or the receptor likes it more, and so it actually kicks the opioid off. So that's what, why it makes it work so quickly and also so well. The unfortunate thing is it actually works for a very, very short period of time, so that in each of the kits that you get, you will always get two doses of naloxone because it's a very short-acting medication. I've also listed on the slide 
a few of the common opioids that you may have heard of. The most common probably would be the fentanyl from the news, morphine that uh, we have heard of from before, heroin, and the, uh, the codeine, which is available over the counter, which I believe Health Canada is re-looking at that um, to see if it's prescription. In the States, it's prescription. Just FYI for everyone, if you carry a bottle of Tylenol 1s from Canada to the States, um, technically Tylenol 1 is prescription strength uh, on, in, the, in the US, so just be careful. Now that we know a little bit more about Noxone, let's talk about why the Ontario government decided to make it so available to everyone. Naloxone kits, both the nasal, so the intranasal, as well as the injectable naloxone kits, were made available to the public starting March 27th, uh, 2018. The injectable versions were actually made available before that. Free of charge, so there's no charge to patients who want to get, uh, to want to get a, sorry, a naloxone kit. It doesn't have to be patients, it could be patients' family members, friends, things like that, uh, or people like that. So that also accounts for the eligibility on there as well. It is a life-saving drug. So uh, that's why the access is for everyone, pretty much. So if you look at the eligibility criteria, it's you know, persons who either currently is using opioids or a past opioid user, family member, friend. So if, if you know someone who uses an opioid that might be at risk for an uh, overdose, then the naloxone kit may be something that you want to have in your medicine cabinet. The question is, well, naloxone the drug. You know, we talk about uh, you know, supplements and, and vitamins and things like that, but naloxone is a drug, so why, why without a prescription? Why, not, why wouldn't you get a prescription for it? So naloxone is safe to administer, even through the nose or through injection, because the only reason why someone would not be able to get a naloxone injection or um, medication is if you're allergic to it. So my patients usually ask me, well, I don't know. If, someone, if I see someone unconscious, I don't know if they're allergic or not. And if you're fearful of if using the naloxone because you're not sure, the best thing is still to call 911 first, get help, and then they can direct you through that. My same thing, if you can't wake them up to ask them, call 911 and then someone will direct you to whether to use it or not. The second reason is to increase access, just because we, not everyone has a family doctor, not everyone has access to a, a prescriber who can give them a prescription to get a prescription filled at a pharmacy. So this is actually without a prescription, you can go straight to the pharmacy or some community centers to actually get this medication. As I was mentioning, where do you get the naloxone kit? You can get it from pharmacies. Um, it's probably the easiest way to get a naloxone kit. No prescription needed. Just make sure you call ahead. I know that uh, it's available. I know in our pharmacy in M1, we do have them available. Uh, but not all pharmacies are, it's not mandatory to have. So they may not have it ready for you to pick up. So just call ahead. But it is a, there's a web, Ontario.ca does have a naloxone website. So you can actually see which pharmacies have them. And then also some community-based community organizations, um, but only for clients, families, and friends, like needle exchange programs and hep C programs, that uh, will also have them to give out. So what's inside the kit? What would the pharmacist be teaching you? When you get a naloxone kit, the first thing is the pharmacist will sit down with you and actually teach you how to use it, recognizing the signs and symptoms like I was talking about, how to use the kit, you know, rescue breathing and chest compressions and or chest compressions. The pharmacist training is not a CPR course. So please don't think that they're gonna teach you CPR from start to finish. Um, I know when I do my first aid and CPR training, it takes two days, okay? In that 15 to 20 minutes of training, you're not gonna get your whole day's worth of CPR training, okay? So it's just basic essential things. And uh, if, you're not sure, like I said, once you get trained, if you're not familiar with 911, the dispatcher will actually help you out in terms of teaching you how to do um, the compressions. So this is actually a handout that's inside of each kit. And there's five steps. And there's an arrow from step five to step three because you may have to give a second dose. So just for the, well, I think it's actually pretty clear, but just to go through it a little bit. So shout and shake to wake. So if you can't wake the person up, then you move to step two. Very quick step one. 911, also very quick step two. And then you give the naloxone. After, after calling 911, the dispatcher picks up, you give the naloxone. Then you perform the rescue breathing and or chest compressions. 
Um, there is a barrier, the one-way valve barrier that helps protect you as the person who may be helping out. If it's not working, repeat step three and continue with step four. Okay, so every kit comes with a barrier as well as comes with uh, gloves. So whenever you're trying to help someone, especially if you don't know them, um, there is always a pair of gloves and there's always a barrier, a face shield, okay, to help protect you against any kind of fluids that may be coming. Okay. So what's in the kit? Um, you can read that, you can come and see it, but this is the injection kit. It always comes with a hard case and it always has the word naloxone on it. So it's like first aid, but first aid with the naloxone inside. And this is the, uh, the kit for the nasal spray. There's less stuff in it because there's less need for needles and, and uh, ampule openers. But the biggest thing is this is medication, just like you would do at home, uh, check your expiry dates. There is always gonna be an expiry date on your medication in the kit. So make sure that you do check it. Uh, it's, check it, I would say twice a year, you know, spring clean, fall clean. It's a good time to clean up your medicine cabinet as well. So the next, the next topic is more legal issues. I know a lot of people are really hesitant on helping. And how many of you have heard of the Good Samaritan Act? Okay, so I wanna make sure that you know that you are protected if you go and help someone. Um, so the classic example that I usually give is if you do CPR and you accidentally crack a rib, that you are protected that you didn't harm this person, you're trying to help save them, okay? Um, so this actually is an extension of the Good Samaritan Act in the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act, where people who, especially those who are, let's say for example, uh, have using illicit drugs together, and witnesses their friend being an, an overdose, they oftentimes are fearful to call for help because they are afraid to get in trouble. So they don't call, and that person may die. So this act protects that person from being, uh, from having that fear because they can, they're protected under the Good Samaritan Over Drug Overdose Act, okay? In certain situations, I can't say every single situation that this person may be in, but it helps to reduce the fear of the police um, to attending to overdose events and to encourage people to actually help save that life and not be so fearful of that situation. I wanted to list some of the uh, situations where you may actually need a naloxone kit, oh, and I'll start to think about whether you need one or not. Going to a place where there's an increased likelihood of drug use, I know I had a security guard come to the pharmacy once and said, can I get a naloxone kit? Because she was actually going to be, uh, she was hired as a security guard for a party that she wasn't familiar with, and it was a rather large party, so she wanted to have something on hand in case. Family member who's using opioids, especially for chronic pain, very high doses like fentanyl patches and um, high dose opioids, uh, potential for misuse, uh, and a healthcare practitioner, you may think, well, why does a healthcare practitioner need a naloxone kit? But uh, we actually have teams of, of healthcare practitioners who go to people's homes or to certain sites to visit patients, and they carry one just in case. It's always just in case. It's like insurance. We, we carry it. We don't want to use it, but it's just in case. We talk about treatment of overdose. We always talk about treatment of disease, treatment of things, but we have to think about prevention. So we have to think about how do we prevent this from happening in the first place. So proper use of medication, including the dose and method, and not sharing medications. You know, what's good for you may not be good for you know, your buddy down the street. Avoid mixing opioids and alcohol. Um, I think the biggest thing for this population, and I think any population, is to make sure that you start low and go slow. Uh, you know, if you have chronic pain, a lot of times prescribers will start you on something that's like Tylenol, an anti-inflammatory, and not start immediately on something that's really, really strong. The biggest, the biggest thing is to make sure that if you do have medication at home, whether it be opioids or whether it be just things you don't take anymore, or whether it be expired medications, is to make sure that you discard of these things properly. Um, I know that a lot of times it's more convenient to just throw it in the garbage, uh, but that's why I said twice a year, clean up your, your cabinet, put it into a bag, and then bring it to your local pharmacy, and we will discard it properly for you. Uh, it won't go into a landfill, it won't flush down the toilet, it won't contribute to the, the, the massive number of prescriptions that sometimes are thrown in the garbage. Okay. 
the last the last note I want to make sure you guys have is if you feel that a naloxone kit is something that you need to have or would like to have in your medicine cabinet, in your first aid kit, speak to your local community pharmacist and, and ask for one. It's Don't be fearful. There is nothing that is bad about having a naloxone kit. Um, I know that sometimes people are afraid of the stigma. Oh, I'm getting a naloxone kit because they're going to think I'm a drug user. It's not because of that. It's because it's, a, it's like having an EpiPen, right? You have an EpiPen to rescue someone when someone needs it. Usually that's prescribed for that patient. But in this case, it may be for a family member that you know of that may be using very high doses of opioids and you want to have it at home just in case, right? Oh, okay, thank you. So thank you very much for your attention. And that concludes the formal presentation for tonight. Uh, now we will begin our question and answer session. But just before that, I want to make sure you guys had an opportunity to write down any more questions that you had on those cards and um, to raise, raise them up and then our volunteers would collect them. You want to come on up? Oh. <laughs> I like this. Whoever, whoever. <laughs> I see some of you brought samples. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go with the two big ones that came up <laughs> across my desk. So. Oh. This is, oh, thank you. Sure. So I'll, I'll filter as I go. So vitamin D and calcium, together, separate, or how long, so the difference between taking it before or after meals, um, you know, how long after a meal do I take it, you know, that kind of thing, and then the... Uh, there's a question, but that's nothing to do with supplements. So I'll leave that be. Um, so, Beth. Okay. okay, so uh, the question was around taking calcium and vitamin D, whether or not you need to take them together, um, as well as the impact of calcium, uh, whether you take it before or after meal. Am I not? Oh, that's better. Um, so calcium and vitamin D don't need to be taken at the same moment in time. But if you take calcium and you don't have enough vitamin D circulating in your system, you are not going to absorb that calcium. So taking the vitamin D on the same day as you're taking the calcium is important. But we also need to divide our doses of calcium. So if you are aiming to meet your minimum needs of calcium um, and you're not being able to do that from diet alone, which would really be the dietary piece, which I think was one of the other questions I saw was, about three servings of dairy products per day. If you aren't able to get it from diet alone and you're trying to make up for that, you don't want to have more than 500 milligrams of calcium at a time because you can't absorb more than 500 mil milligrams of calcium at a time. So that's where you get into that expensive urine piece of things. Um, and whether you take it before or after a meal, if it's calcium citrate, it really doesn't matter. If it's calcium carbonate and you take it on an empty stomach, and you'll correct me if I've got this backwards, please. Um, it'll act more as an antacid. And if you take it, oh my God, have I got it backwards? Sorry, I only I heard the after the calcium carbonate, like on an empty stomach, acts as an antacid. Yep. And if you take it with food, it acts as a calcium supplement. Can I add to that, please? It depends on what kind of calcium you're taking as well. So um, there's calcium carbonate, there's calcium citrate. So so yeah, so it depends. So make sure that you find out which calcium you're taking because that makes a difference. Okay. Um, there's a, oh, thank you. There's been a couple questions about Zostavax and um, patients who've had Zostavax and now want to get the shingles, the Shingrix vaccine. Um, is how long, what's the duration of between the Zostavax and the Shingrix? And then also if, um, can you still get, shingles, can you still get shingrix after you've had shingles? 
both very good questions. Um, so if you've already had people in the audience who've already had the, the Zostavax, that first vaccine, yes, you should get the Shingrix and you need to wait at least one year after having that Zostavax to get the Shingrix. Um, that's, there's some mixed data on that, but that's, that's mostly what I'm seeing is one year. And that goes for having shingles as well. So if you've had shingles recently, you've got to wait a year before you go and get that, that Shingrix vaccine. Okay. So those are questions that your healthcare provider should ask you as well. Have you had shingles? When did you have that? And have you had the previous va vaccine? Um, because the timing can change. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, this question maybe I can answer. Uh, vitamins, just so I, I'm guessing some of you have expired vitamins in your in your cabinet. And the question is, is it okay to take? Uh, I'll break this in, I'll break this into parts. Um, it is not okay to take because we don't typically research what your vitamins and minerals break down into, and that's where that safety comes into play. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. Code Omega. Trauma bed. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. Code Omega. Trauma bed. And uh, the, the second part of that question is, is it effectiveness compromised? And I usually say yes. I mean, if it's expired a couple days or a couple, you know, in a couple of weeks, I would say probably not. But if it's you know, a month, two months, like I said about the degradation or the, the breakdown of medication, vitamins we consider still are able to break down into something else. And that, because it's not in its original form, can potentially cause the effectiveness to decrease as well. And the second, well, third part to this question is, is it too much to take multivitamins once a day? Daphne, can I pass that to you? So the answer to that question is, um, it would totally depend on you. <laughs> so uh, what's in the multivitamin that you're thinking about taking? Are there any other medications you're taking uh, that it might interfere with or any of the ingredients might interfere with? Um, and um, how does it impact your pocketbook and everything else? Um, as a general rule, multivitamins, I don't believe are thought to be harmful but they're not also typically thought to be helpful, so. Thank you. Um, next question is, I think there's a lot of interest about the shingles vaccine. Um, can we assume that shingles vaccine should be repeated after nine years? So there's, a, all, there's always a lot of questions about um, the long, longevity of your immune protection from from vaccines. And a lot of the time we don't have answers because there isn't, there aren't enough studies that are looking really long-term, right? So if we're talking nine years is actually a pretty good report of, of evidence um, for vaccines, but unfortunately I can't comment on that. I've not seen anything yet in term, any longer than that. So that's why I brought that number to you is because that's the longest that I'd seen. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're not going to continue to track this and, and the efficacy and track the antibody response and immune response 20 years down the road. So um, unfortunately, I can't comment on anything after nine years. Thank you. Um, this answers most of these questions, but um, this question I can probably answer. Where did you get the quote of $150 uh, for a Shingrix shot? This, uh, this audience member said, I paid $180 per dose at Shoppers. <laughs> And um, from a pharmacy standpoint, every pharmacy you go to, especially because this medication is not covered, uh, if it's covered by your insurance, then you may not see that dollar figure at all. But if you see that dollar figure because you're paying out of pocket, every pharmacy, uh, just to simplify things, has a different markup and it's a different fee. Okay, so those are the two varying structures of where every pharmacy may give you a different price. So if you want to price shop because it is coming out of your own pocket, call around and just ask for if you're you know, passing by a Shoppers or Rexall or Loblaws, then you can actually go and, and ask that. Yes. That's a good question. <laughs> um, we would probably be a little bit cheaper than Shoppers, but I can't guarantee that because I don't, I don't know what the shop, I mean, uh, this is an estimation as well. If you want, you can, you know, you can call us or walk by. We're not open now, though, so <laughs> um, you can walk by and ask, okay? But you do need a prescription, so just make sure you do have a prescription. Right. Uh, vitamin B12. 
What are its uses? I'm guessing this one's for me. Yes. <laughs> um, so vitamin B12 is important uh, for brain and nerve function. It's a water-soluble vitamin, which means we pee it out if we get too much. Um, yeah. That's that's very good. <laughs> um, are there any vaccines that do not contain thimerosal or mercury preservatives? You might be able to help out, out with this too, but um, most of the thimerosal comes in the multi-dose vials of vaccines as a preservative because there are let's say 10 doses in a vial. So some of the flu vaccines, and um, actually last year, I don't think we did have multi-dose, we had individuals, but some years we do have multiple doses in each vial. So we will, we will draw up uh, a dose from that 10 dose vial. Often those are the ones that do have thimerosal. Um, in terms of the ones I talked about, all of those um, are individual dose. I can't comment specifically with 100% certainty that they don't have thimerosal, but just so you know that usually it's because they are in a, if, if there is thimerosal, it's a multi-dose vial. Yeah, and they've actually tried really hard to eliminate thimerosal from vaccines in general because of the concerns and the hesitation to get vaccines with anything that actually has thimerosal in it. They've tried to remove on the market and use something else, but um, that's what I would have answered as well. Uh, there's... Uh, if there's a, being a diabetic, should, should diabetics have uh, Prevnar and Pneumovax uh, on an annual basis? On an annual basis? Yeah, yearly. Okay. Um, good question. And remember I spoke about the high-risk groups. So National Advisory Committee considers having diabetes an increased risk for pneumonia. So the, that individual should definitely receive the Prevnar. That's my recommendation. It does, it would cost for that person. It's not covered, Prevnar, and then Pneumovax, but not annually. That's not an annual. That can be counted as that is your full set. Unless you are a very, very high risk, you are then become later on down the road, not just diabetes, but you have other conditions, immunocompromising um, or other things that come up. Five or 10 years later, you can get a reboost of Pneumovax 23. Having them too often and too close together actually blunts the immune response. So that's why, like we spoke about with shingles, you have to wait at least a year after a shingles event or the previous vaccine to get your next shingles vaccine. It's for the same reason. It can actually blunt the initial body's immune response to building uh, that, the antibodies and the immune memory from that initial vaccine. So too close together with those few, the pneumonia and the shingles, also not good, okay? Uh, the next question is, when was naloxone discovered and why was opioids drug of choice for in pain? Uh, I don't know the answer to the first one, so I, I can, whoever asked that question can come find me and I can give you my email, I can email you. And uh, why was opioids the drug of choice? I think it's, it was effective. So for example, opi opium, and morphine, which was extracted from, uh, from the opium plant, was effective in very severe pain. And so they didn't have anything else at that time. So that's where that kind of stemmed from. And it's the choice because it really depends on who, who the, who's making the choice. I think there are, there's a drive to better prescribing practices and not using opioids as often and as much and using other pain alternatives uh, instead of straight going to opioids. So I don't know if it was a marketing thing back in the day that started it, but um, that could be part of it as well. Okay. Uh, Daphne, if you can try, maybe, I don't know if you know anything about turmeric or omega-3 supplements um, in terms of reducing inflammation in joints. So the short answer is, I don't know about turmeric outside of food. Um, and the second was vitamin oh, omega-3 oh, omega for yeah. inflammation. So the short answer to that is that there are some studies that have looked at it, but it's not proven to be effective for decreasing inflammation. Okay. 
a lot of people are asking about vitamin B12 today. Uh, <laughs> so they're asking, does it help prevent fatigue? And then there was a second part of that question was, when is it appropriate to get injections versus an oral supplement? Okay, so I don't know if anybody was paying attention to the news today about vitamin B12 sup, uh, injections. Um, apparently, it's costing us millions and millions of dollars in Ontario unnecessarily. Um, does getting B12 help to decrease fatigue? I would say only if you have uh, pernicious anemia, which would be a B12 deficiency. Um, otherwise, no, it shouldn't. Uh, decrease your uh, fatigue. And in terms of B12 shots, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, when when is it appropriate to get a B12 shot versus taking oral B12? So oral B12 for most people should be sufficient um, if you are deficient in B12. However, there are some exceptions. So if you are, um, if you've had a malabsorptive surgery, um, so think about uh, bariatric surgery or um, some other reason that you might not be absorbing B12, um, then you may need a shot. Um, or if you are um, have been taking B12 supplements and your doctor or nurse practitioner has rechecked your levels and they're still not coming up, then it would be appropriate to get a B12 shot. Thank you. Um, it says, sure. <laughs> okay. So I would say that it would make for expensive urine if your B12 levels are okay. It's the same thing I say for people who, who load up on vitamin C. It's the same thing. So it, you need a certain level, but once you go above and beyond that, what happens is, like Daphne was saying, you end up peeing out your money. So it's not worth your money um, to do, do that. So it would be worth you checking with your doctor to get a full panel of blood to find out why you're so exhausted. It, it could be anything that's causing your exhaustion, whether or not it's B12 without knowing you and what kind of surgeries you've had and what your medical history is and your blood work. It'd be really impossible for me to guess. Yeah. I hear you. So anyway, that was my question about the purchase of the Thank you. You're welcome. Um, can you take vitamin D with orange juice? And do you need it do you need to take it with food to be effective? Okay, so vitamin D you can take with orange juice. Um, it's not gonna help with the absorption of vitamin D. Um, the only thing that really helps you to absorb vitamin D better is if you take it with fattier foods. Um, so if you took it with a higher fat milk, for example, or if you had it when you were having some bread and butter or margarine or you know, a salad with some salad dressing on there that had some oil in it, that'll help to improve the absorption of the vitamin D. Thank you. 
um, along the vitamin D line. Uh, sorry. That's okay. It says, uh, why? so if there's no benefit beyond 400 international units, why are, are a lot of doctors or prescribers or even you know, healthcare providers saying you need to take a thousand? And uh, Health Canada also recommends a thousand as well. So the reason Health Canada recommends a thousand and why if you are, you know, 65 or older, your doctor or nurse practitioner has probably recommended this for you, is because we live in Canada, where we don't get sunshine all that much for a good chunk of the year. And if you lived in Florida in the winters and you were here in the summers, you probably wouldn't need to be taking a thousand units of vitamin D a day. But because we live in a darker, colder country, you need the extra vitamin D. Thank you. Uh, do vitamins and supplements lose their potency when taken with taken at dinner time with wine <laughs> <laughs> or beer? Right? They don't no judge. <laughs> um, so it's a really good question. Um, I would have to check for the individual vitamins. We we have a database that we use to check a drug and herb food interactions. Um, so it would be something I'd have to check for each one that somebody was taking. Awesome. Thank you. Comments on the new Canadian food guide. <laughs> I'm guessing it's for our dietitians. Or, or, or also for yeah, our... Yeah, <laughs> I about this I'll, I'll, I'll add on. Okay. So the new Canada's food guide, I think, is extremely well-intentioned. Okay? And... <laughs> Did that come out the way that I intended it? Maybe. Um, so I really, really like the plate method for anyone who has ever seen a dietitian. We have been preaching the plate method, which is basically half your plate veg, a quarter starch, a quarter protein. Well, I've been in practice for more than 15 years and since before then, I can tell you. Um, so it's great that Canada's Food Guide has finally caught up with that. That being said, I find Canada's Food Guide lacking in a couple of areas. One they got rid of dairy, which is particularly important for my pregnant population um, and also for those with bone health issues. In addition to that, um, I find it's a bit confusing when you look at the picture of the food guide and you see a piece of bread that's like this big. Um, I think it, it can be really difficult for people to interpret what that means in terms of actual portion sizes when they're just trying to show that that's you know, part of the, the starch component. Anything else you want to add? Okay, very good. Um, I, so the question says, I had a pneumonia vaccine 10 years ago. Can I get the newer vaccine now? In short, yes. And depending on your risk factors that we, we always have to consider, and you know, I mentioned a lot about risk factors and being a high risk person. So if something may have changed with your risk category, risk stratification in that 10 years, right? You may have developed diabetes or, um, you know, kidney disease or something else that would now really put you into a higher risk. And I would recommend getting Prevnar. And then you may need another Pneumovax after that. Thank you. A uh, question about taking a particular medication for the past five years and uh, been diagnosed with osteoporosis. So the question is, should I take medication like uh, an osteoporosis medication prescribed by a physician or by a nurse practitioner? supplements or just eat calcium rich foods like drinking milk and, and more dairy so i think all three of us can comment on this yeah. um i would certainly say that if you have osteoporosis it is very unlikely that you're going to be able to meet your vitamin d needs from food alone um, calcium you may be able to do um, but you'd want somebody bless you to assess that um, and i would never suggest that somebody not take their prescription medications for osteoporosis um, in, you know, in lieu of, of vitamins. Yeah. yeah. I definitely think that that's a combination thing, right? So if you're taking medications for your osteoporosis, that might be something that helps rebuild um, the bone that you, you know, with the calcium that you're taking in, you actually need both. Then if you've got this, you have to have the calcium and the D around to be able to create that bone. So it is important that you do um, you know, make up uh, that additional calcium in your diet. And I know we were talking about supplements. So 
if you did notice on the slides that Daphna had, that increased cal high, high doses of calcium do put you at risk for cardiac um, you know, disease. Um, so I, I usually don't tell my patients to take any more than half of their recommended calcium intake um, to help with their osteoporosis by supplementation. So if the recommendation is 1,200 milligrams, I usually tell my patients no more than 600. However, it's independent for each person. But usually half and half is what I do. Half supplement and make up the rest diet. That's my I, I concur. Uh, <laughs> but um, it is very much, uh, the pharmacist, we also recommend doing everything uh, because the medication works in one way. The calcium needs to be there for you to continue to build bone. And vitamin D helps with the, with the calcium. So if you're missing a piece, it's like missing a piece of the puzzle. So you, you, can't, you can't go with one and not the other. So I want to make sure the timing lies. Sorry? Oh, sorry. I, I, I heard a question. Um, so if you drink, if you drink, I think this is along the same line, if you drink three glasses of milk a day and take a vitamin D, do you need to take calcium? So three glasses of milk at the same time of day, probably. If you spread them out, probably not. And just as a caveat to that, if we're talking about uh, cow's milk, you're probably good to go. If you're talking about um, a nut milk, which is, I guess, a nut beverage, it's not really a milk, <laughs> um, you need to make sure, or a soy beverage or rice beverage, um, that can hold true as well, but you need to make sure that it's fortified with calcium and vitamin D. They are not all fortified. Yep. yep. About 300 milligrams. Yeah. Yep. Goat's milk also would be equivalent to cow's milk. So there was a question about glucosamine, and I'm guessing if it's effective, how do you use it? What is it for? I am not an expert on glucosamine. I would have to look that up. So if that's you, um, just find me at the end, and I will look it up for you and get back to you. Do you mind if I add my two cents? Please. Is that okay? So glucosamine typically is used um, alongside with chondroitin and MSM for joint health, typically knees, uh, so bigger joints. Uh, there's not a lot of research saying that it's effective, so, but there are some healthcare providers who do recommend the glucosamine. And I say, take it with a grain of salt, try it. You try it for two months. If it doesn't work, then don't try it anymore, okay? So it, it's the same thing as, uh, as the vitamin C. If you do too much of it, you're just peeing it out. Glucosamine, if it's not working for you, there's no point in continuing to take it. Okay. I think I just want to make sure the timing wise, sorry. How much vitamin C is too much vitamin C? And so that it causes breast cancer. Oh. I need to look up that number. Um, but generally, I wouldn't be recommending that anyone take more than 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day, with one exception. There is some evidence that if you are getting a cold and you take a high-dose vitamin C, I think it's, I want to say it's 8,000 milligrams, as soon as you start to feel your first symptom, it shortens the um, duration and severity of your cold. You know, finally a cure for the common cold. I've actually, I've seen the study. This yeah. is not like, you know, no, my mother. <laughs> what is a high dose of vitamin E that can cause a stroke? So I wouldn't recommend anything over 400 international units of vitamin E at a time. Do you agree with that? I do. I do. Uh, do you need only one shingles vaccine after age 50 or does the vaccine only last for so many years? It kind of goes with the last question. Yeah, it sort of goes along with the, um, one of the other questions um, that we don't know past nine years really if there's how much waning of those antibodies and that immune response. So I can't comment past the, ten, the nine year mark. Yeah. What was the first part of that question? Uh, do you, you need, need only one, one so, after age um, If you're doing the Shingrix, that's two. But yes, two create that, that sort of one um, set. 
of, of to get you the immunity you need, but we don't know past the nine years at okay. this point. Thank you. Uh, someone asked what D3 is versus just vitamin D. Vitamin D3 is the active form of vitamin D. So um, it just means your body has to do less work converting uh, from other forms of vitamin D. Okay, I think we're closing in on the end of our list of questions. Oh, oh we have another question there. Yes, oh, sorry. Oh, there's one oh, in there as well. <laughs> We have, we have more questions. That's okay. Just put up your hand. If you have more questions, if, if we have sparked a couple more questions, please just put your hand up and we can bring those up. I, I, think, I think that's... Um, it's okay. I'll, I'll give it to you afterwards. Um, thanks. Uh, is there research into marijuana for pain? I can't really comment on that because I haven't actually read any of the research. I know that it works for some, but um, it really depends on what form you're using it in, the mixture, the ratio. Uh, I think that's a very interesting topic because a lot of people are actually looking into medicinal marijuana, but also with marijuana being legal now, uh, what the ratio is, what the aspect is, do I use oils versus the herb? So there's a lot of questions. I don't know if our, the rest of our panelists know anything about it. It's definitely a hot topic. I mean, you, you would have been seeing all about this and you would have seen shops around town and the new licensed um, sellers as well. Um, but more of the evidence that's coming out is around pain. It's, it's mostly around pain. And, and you would have heard it talked about in terms of anxiety, depression, anything under the sun, any ailment that anyone has in this room, people will be talking about it as the miracle cure. Um, but truly the evidence is coming out around um, pain management and also around cancer pain and, and post-cancer treatments and related to nausea, um, anorexia, so not having appetite, that kind of thing. Um, that's where more of the evidence is. But um, if, if there was any specific questions around that, there are certain providers who are trained and specialized in uh, the use of marijuana um, oils um, and, and anything around that. So, thank you. Uh, so, the vaccines that we talked about today, tonight, uh, if we had had childhood vaccines, do we still have antibodies in our body? Uh, antibodies in our body uh, by the time we are fifty or older. Good question. Yes, um, our immune systems have an extraordinary memory. <laughs> And um, they, we do still have antibodies, but some of them do wean. So um, that's why we talk about some of these boosters that are important that we do see weaning. So the pertussis antibodies um, can be weaning and don't have as enough strength by the time you're over 50. And that includes the, the chicken pox, right? So that's why people get shingles. So that's the, the antibodies and the immune system we can just a little bit enough to allow that to erupt. Um, so I, I didn't actually talk about the mechanisms of shingles, but it is relevant to, to this, that when you get chicken pox as a child, um, you, you develop all your little spots, you get over that, but the, it, it stays in your body. Okay, so that, that virus is still around, and it gets suppressed and put away, hidden in your nervous system. And that's why when your immune system drops, it can't keep it in, in place. It sneaks out and it sneaks out along the nerve. And that's where the blisters show up. So if your immune system's weaning, that's why the, the shingles vaccine is so important to get before you get past 50. And that's why they recommend at 50 um, is that it starts to wean at about that time. So um, yes, yeah, some of them can wean. You can't check all these antibodies. They're just, it's not practical to be checking in your blood. There's certain things we can check for, like measles, mumps, and rubella, chicken pox. You, we can test those in the immunity to see if there are antibodies, hepatitis B as well, um, but not all of them, not tetanus, not uh, pertussis. Along the line of pertussis, mm. uh, up to what age do we need to get the whooping cough vaccine? Is there an upper limit? No upper limit that I know of. Um, if you're, you're at risk at any time, if you haven't had one adult. Um, adult dose and you're at risk of sharing it with others. So there's no top limit on that one. 
That there's two, um, there are two different uh, vaccines that have that. It's tetanus diphtheria and pertussis. And we're talking about adult vaccines here. Um, Adacel is the primary one we have right now. We did have Boostrix for a while. Uh, I'm not seeing it now. I'm not getting that one in, in family practice, but it's Adacel, A-D-A-C-E-L. And that has tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis all together. This may or may not be the last question, but um, could you speak about magnesium? And I'm guessing about uh, supplementing magnesium in, in your diet. So magnesium is one of those really interesting things where um, getting too much magnesium, um, instead of having expensive urine, it comes out the other direction. Um, and so when you get too much magnesium, and you may have you know, somewhere along the way heard about milk of magnesia, we use it to uh, relieve and prevent constipation. So too much magnesium can have that same effect, even though that might not have been what you were looking for. Um, we have no evidence that taking extra magnesium helps with bone health. Um, a lot of naturopaths are recommending magnesium for sleep. Um, I haven't seen anything to actually support that. Um, some people are using it for leg cramps. The evidence for that is extremely weak. Um, so I, and I'm going to tell you, it's really hard to be deficient in magnesium. Most foods have magnesium in them. So yeah, please. Just to add to that, um, we, there, there is some evidence to show that magnesium supplementation helps in migraine, migraine prophylaxis. Um, so some of our um, guidelines that we use for migraine prevention, so people who have chronic migraines, the Center for Effective Practice um, that originates down at St. Mike's wrote a guideline on, for headache management, and they ac actually had compiled studies to show that magnesium, I think it was about 300 milligrams, um, it can be used daily in the prevention um, of, ma of migraines. So that's, uh, that's where I will use it um, with my patients. And I have seen it for the used, um, not for sleep specifically, but for restless leg syndrome, specific diagnosis related to that. And I have seen some of the neurologists using that as a recommendation for people who have chronic diagnosed right, restless leg syndrome. Thank you. So the evidence for... Sorry. The evidence for leg cramps is extremely, extremely weak. Yeah. That doesn't mean it won't help. So one of, the, one of the tough things about nutritional supplements and evidence is that the people who often pay for these studies are drug companies, and drug companies want to sell drugs. They don't want to sell vitamins. So it does get more challenging to fund these kinds of studies to any power, which can be difficult for us to get the, the evidence that we need. I think that one of the reasons why we're gonna end up with so much evidence for marijuana is because it's a big money maker for, uh, for big business and for the government potentially. So I think they're gonna fund a lot of studies for that, but not for, our, not for our nutrition, unfortunately. Big pharma, not big broccoli. Right? Yes, not big broccoli. <laughs> Um, I, I, I definitely agree as a pharmacist. I think it's, it's tough to tell someone to not take a supplement when you could easily, I could turn around and you can buy it anyway. But my biggest word of advice is make sure it doesn't do any harm because if you are just grabbing something off the shelf, my classic example is, well, St. John's Word is, is over the counter but it actually has a lot of interactions that you may not be aware of. So, you know, when, when the pharmacist asks you and takes the, you know, sits you down for a counsel and says, what other medications are you taking? Oh, you know, just stuff over the counter. Stuff over the counter is actually very important to us as well. So are you taking a calcium supplement because you're a doctor or, or someone told you to do so and I'm giving you an antibiotic that you can't take calcium with? So if you don't tell me that, that might be actually very important because then your infection doesn't go away. So it's one of those things where, you know, we, we ask not just what else do you take? Do you take any supplements? Do you use any eye drops? Do you use any, you know, other things over the counter that I would need to know about to prevent these interactions? And I think every healthcare professional asks that as well. 
So we've, uh, just in light of time, I know there's, a, there's still a stack of, of questions, uh, but in light of time, we want to make sure that we close up so that we all can go home and get a good night's rest, because that's just as important for our health as well. Um, so we've come to, the, come to the conclusion of our, our question and answer session. I want to thank all of our incredible speakers uh, for their great presentations. And uh, for just the next few minutes, we'll be available for any further questions if you want to ask us specifically. And just before we, we, we let you go, I have a, a few housekeeping items just to make sure that uh, you're aware. So there is a Sunnybrook blog called The Personal Health Navigator and provides advice to patients. And if you haven't read it, you should go read it. Some of the articles are really, really good. And uh, about the hospital, but also about general health, uh, healthcare inquiries. If you have a question, um, just write to the writer and contact the writer, Paul Taylor at askpaul at sunnybrook.ca. And a very special thank you to all our speakers and to all, all of you for attending. I know some of you had gone home, but that's okay. <laughs> and for those, those of you at home as well, uh, just be sure to, there's, a, there's an evaluation form as well. Just be sure to make sure you complete the evaluation form on your way out uh, and pick up a free parking voucher. Uh, also visit the Sunnybrook website at sunnybrook.ca for updates. And uh, we also have two more talks, as Helen had mentioned, this year. And so make sure that you register for those. They're very interesting, interesting topics. So make sure that uh, you register for those. And thank you once again for joining us this evening. Have a good night.